look at them, so it's fun to share them when we're waiting. Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Well, cool. If we're ready, let's uh, let's jump into this um, and just kind of uh, just to start out. Um, you know, I think everybody loves to know kind of um, you know as a director, you're you're given the script, and it's it's kind of a key moment in the um, in the story in season seven. Um, there's a lot that that spins out of this episode. So what were your thoughts initially when you, when you were handed the script and they said, this is your episode that you're gonna be working on? Okay, well, this is the first episode of The Walking Dead that I got to direct, right? Mm -hmm. So I was like really excited and really scared and really nervous. But before I went down to Atlanta, um, to Georgia, then you know I had a call with Scott Gimple and he was like, oh, I've been waiting for this episode for years. Like, I've just been waiting for this moment, this calm moment. And I was like, oh my God, like, how can like, I possibly do anything that will live up to Scott Gimble's expectation of this episode and this story between Carl and Negan? I was like, oh my God. So I felt that, that pressure and that uh, burden and that excitement of like doing something that would blow him away and honoring that story, the sort of iconic story between Megan and Carl. So I was like foremost excited. And then when I got there, um, I walked into the production office and which by the way, you can stop me anytime if I'm going off on tangents. Oh, no, I, not at all. <laughs> great. So when I got to Georgia and then I put it's all like so fresh in my memory. And I pulled up into the parking spot and it's just marked like, you know, director. I was like, oh, this is so cool. I have my own spot right outside the production office, which I always do as director, but for some reason there, like everything has more weight at the walking dead, right? <laughs> so then I just walk into the building. And, and I walk in, and I don't know where I'm going, but I walk in, there's this very small little lobby entrance thing, and I walk in, and Greg Nicotero is right there. And I'm like, oh, wow. oh my God. <laughs> and then, like, I see him, and he's like, hi, welcome. And one of the first things he said, then there's a set of stairs that you go up for the offices, right? And so one of the first things he said is, hi, I'm Greg. I'm like, I know, like, I'm a real fan of your work. <laughs> and then he said, I'm here to help you shine. And I was like, oh my uh -huh. God, like everything just went like, this is going to be an amazing experience. And it continued from there. I went upstairs, you showed me where my office was and I walked in and there was, um, the comic was there and it was all flagged, like marked, like what pages to look at. And, and the conversation started right away about how to honor you know, the comic to the show and the live action and sort of you know, for me to go through and see what was I going to marry as close as possible and then what was going to be fictionalized or veer off from that. So yeah, it was, it was amazing from the beginning. Very difficult, but amazing. Great. I think Dawn, I think you're up. Okay. Um, yeah, obviously the whole episode has several uh, iconic comic scenes. Um, but one of the biggest is um, Negan introducing Carl to the his harem uh, of wives, and that's such an iconic moment. But it's also a really controversial <laughs> moment uh, amongst you know fans. Is were you aware of that controversy before you went into it, and how did you deal with that in shooting the the scene? I don't even know that I know about the controversy. <laughs> Probably I want to. Well. Maybe it'll trigger my memory. Maybe I just forgot. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, <laughs> just because I think the the, um, the the question of whether the women are there, obviously they're there under some form of duress, but is it, would you classify it as sex work or is it, some people think it's rape and, you know, how to um, put that across, because obviously at that point Negan is the big bad, but knowing that here he is having a developing a relationship with Carl that's quite um <laughs> I won't say paternal but <laughs> a good relationship and and dealing with that keeping him human uh, keeping Negan human in those scenes 
Well, yeah, I mean, that's a good question. And yes, I was aware of that sort of line and, and that that was an issue. And that even came, I didn't know if you were going to throw something at me. I wasn't sure. And I was like, <laughs> I wanted to be open to like learning. Oh, yeah. I want to learn you. more too. Um, but anyway, that was definitely a line trying to uh, ride that line. And part of the conversation for me, which I didn't quite win, to be honest with you, was what they were going to be wearing. Mm -hmm. And so I, you know, because I like extremes and because I'm not really afraid to dive into whatever it is, even if it's politically incorrect or if it, whatever it is or evil or dark, like I just want to go as far as we can. And if it's light, then go as far as we can with that. So mm -hmm. um, I wanted them to really wear like crazy sexy shit. <laughs> like really go there and it was not really about that. It became more like um, like a uniform sort of, not uniform, but like a, a look that they all sort of had. And I struggled a little bit because I think one of the lines was about, you know, like Carl sort of clocking because he hasn't really seen women like this before. Yeah. And so I really wanted it a reaction from him and seeing women in really sexy, like really like seeing them, you know, their cleavage and like really being a little bit more explicit, particularly for the show. Cause it's so out there and not <laughs> what we do that I thought it was an opportunity to do that. But I think, you know, again, I think, you know, Scott at the time was Scott and, you know, everybody sort of trying to, um, to adhere to the bigger picture. And, and sort of being aware of the fans and, and what's gonna happen. So that was a little bit of a thing that, I wouldn't call it a battle, but like I didn't get it exactly the way I wanted it. Let's just say that. It's a good question though. I like that oh, question. Thank you. Nobody's asked me about that before. <laughs> thank you. Awesome, thanks, Renee. Oh, the, um, the scene with Olivia and Negan, I, lo I just thought that was really outstanding when they're in the, at the house and everything. So kind of a two part question. I wondered if this, you know, the slap was scripted or if that just came about organically. And then I, you know, I said it's a powerful scene showing Olivia's vulnerability as well as her strength that we didn't know she possessed, mm -hmm. but also showing Negan and his true colors. So what, like, what was the mood, you know, during the filming of that scene? The slap was scripted. However, you know, movie slaps, are movie slaps. They're not real slaps. <laughs> Only this one turned into a real slap. <laughs> oh, that didn't quite go the, as well as like, it went great for me as a director because I'm like, I got the reaction that was like, that was real. Yeah. Like, Jeffrey's reaction was real because he was not expecting to get slapped that hard. <laughs> so that wasn't, didn't really make him happy either. Um, although he can handle it, of course, you know, it was a little bit like, woo. <laughs> but um, I thought it was a really good moment for both of the characters. You mm -hmm. know, I think, I think the whole episode, what was fun for me, because I had worked with Jeffrey Dean Morgan on The Good Wife. Mm -hmm. And so I just love him. He's like, became like a friend. So I'm actually, I might have told you this before, Sarah, but like when I, I'm on the show because of him. Did I tell you that before? I don't think you mentioned that, no. Okay, so I'll tell you this story because this is like crazy. It's like, I remember coming home and walking in my front door and I got a text and it was like, hey, do you want to come do The Walking Dead? And I was like, but I didn't have it in my phone. So I didn't know who it was. It was just a random <laughs> number. So I was like, my husband was in the kitchen and I was like, Nestor, somebody's asking me if I want to do The Walking Dead. <laughs> and I was like excited. And he goes, well, just say, fuck yeah. And excuse me, who is this? <laughs> I literally did that. I wrote, fuck yeah, and excuse me, who is this? And like Jeffrey Dean, I was like, oh my God, because I was embarrassed I didn't have his number like in my phone. Um, so I like called him right away and he's like, yeah, I'm going, I'm doing this character and I'm going to like talk to Gimple like in a couple of days. And so I just want to know, should I throw your name out there? To dry? And I was like, absolutely. And so I think that was, Scott thinking also knowing that we were friends and had worked together before and then knowing that like this was uh, a really good acting opportunity too because I think it really set off 
um, Jeffrey's path with Megan of being a very complicated, I mean, if I could say, I actually think he's the most complicated villain like ever because he's so charismatic. He's not one note dark. He's, you know, you're drawn into him. He's like cold and evil and then sexy and then, you know, pulls you in. And then I do believe he cares about Carl. And it was really important like to sort of have him a little bit of his past, like not that we literally necessarily knew his past at that point or all of it, I think I found that out later, you know, later episodes, right? But at that point to know that the wounds of his past were going to inform him relating to Carl and that there was a human in there that was very damaged and that we could bring that out in this episode. And I think that's what Jeffrey did. And I think it's continued in his whole journey here. And it's, I really do think he's like amazing. Oh yeah. So I actually had a question about the the slap <laughs> as well. Um, I did listen to uh, Ann and JDM a little bit and in an interview about it, and you know he said like go for it. He wasn't expecting that much, so <laughs> the reaction from Megan is really his reaction. Um, well, Ann says that whenever she actually you know went full force and went for it, that a lot of people on set were like oh my god what was your specific reaction to her actually you know going for it well i'm i'm you know i'm very protective of actors right so i want to make sure that the rest of the day is going to go okay we had more to shoot and so i don't want you know any actor i mean nobody wants to get slapped in the face right yeah. like for real like it hurts <laughs> and it's also it, it crosses a bit of a boundary between people and between actors and what's supposed to happen on set. So I'm not trying to be over dramatic about it. I'm just saying that, yeah. you know, and that's not like that hasn't happened in the past. Some directors manipulate people to get them to do things like that. I'm not that person because I trust actors to bring what they need to bring. So when that happens and it's unexpected, my first instinct is to make sure both of them are okay, particularly Jeffrey, cause he got slapped. And you know, that we all communicate about what happened the crew is the crew, but to make sure that they're okay so that we can go on to do the rest of the scene and do the rest of the coverage and that everyone's comfortable. And so they get to say what they feel in the moment. You know what I mean? We don't just like, okay, cut, that was great, we're moving on. Which, you know, yeah. lots of times, but not in this instance. <laughs> yeah, but it was great. I mean, I think, I think it was great and I love the moment. And I think, you know, she's kind of speaks for every woman in the world that wants to do something like that. And, you know, and a lot of us, you know, we have the Me Too movement, but even then it really wasn't happening. And, you know, we've all, all of us, I'm sure every one of you and me, and we've all had multiple occasions to do that and did not do it. So it's very satisfying in that moment to know that someone, you know, he's calling her fat and then he wants to have sex with her. Like, it's just so demeaning on every level and humiliating. And the fact that she got to do that was it's very rewarding, I think. Yeah, even her expressions in that scene just nailed it because you can see like the devastation of her. Like, I'm in this situation. He just asked to have sex with me. He just called me fat. And then as soon as you know, that, that shift, you see her go from like the devastation to really? <laughs> yeah. She's amazing. I don't know if she said in that interview or not, but like she had a death in her family, like, oh. you know, and it happened like that day or something, um, or the day before, I can't remember, but it was a really, really hard emotional time for her as well. So Oh, wow. Again, I was very protective of that as well, with not overshooting, not asking them to do it too many times, you know, and making sure that she was okay, too. So she was working on a lot of emotions under the surface that day as well. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, I think that's... I, I, oh, sorry, Sarah. <laughs> oh, I was just going to say, I, I just, it, I think that's one of the most interesting things about this episode is that there are so many, like, it, it, it's like a ping pong game of light and dark and heavy mm -hmm. and funny and inappropriately funny mm -hmm. and just as dark as you can possibly I mean from ironing someone's face to talking mm -hmm. about a baseball bat like mm -hmm. as a woman like these these weird moments you know 
what I, I know we've talked to um, we've talked to actors before about you know they they actually have more fun with the darker bits than the lighter bits you know like you'd yeah. think they would have more fun having fun on set but it's it's actually the reverse for them but from your perspective what was it like you know because you did have to kind of run the gamut of um you know from carl going on this weird tour of the house and and then the weird tour of the sanctuary like what was the mood was it was it a fun set or was it kind of still intense just because of where it falls in the story in season seven well i would say that Truly, honestly, the word that jumps out for me is excruciatingly hot. It was so <laughs> hot. I mean, the temperature, I think, was like in the hundreds down there. It was so crazy. And, you know, Negan and Jeffrey having to wear that leather jacket all the time is just brutal. Um, having to do the scene with the iron and indoors. And, you know, I mean, it was, so that's what comes to me is like, we were all so hot and smelly and gross through the whole thing. Um, probably the, the, you know, Negan's lair there was a little bit more comfortable. I think that was the only scene that I remember like, oh, okay. But everything outdoors, everything in, inside the sanctuary is really hot. So I think what happens, the reason that we like doing the dark stuff is because that's not the stuff that you do in between takes. Like in between takes, you do the fun stuff. You're hugging on each other, you love each other, and that's real. Like that's happening all the time. In between, people um, kind of hang close. They don't disappear on The Walking Dead. They're always around. Mm -hmm. So you can always chat with them. They're always like talking to each other, or talking to the crew. Like everyone stays connected. Mm -hmm. um, and that helps us move quickly, but it also helps keep the mood up. Right. And so, um, you know, so nobody really is an asshole and in indulging that dark side of themselves <laughs> on that show. They're really not. Everyone knows it's, it's kind of like, you know, the craziness that happens here, not, not with like, the racism right now, but like when the coronavirus first came and then people band together and they try to help each other. And so every day on The Walking Dead is that mentality. It's like, we're gonna do this. We're gonna climb this mountain together and we're gonna get through it. And nobody really complains, nobody whines. They just, so they bring their best all the time. And so that's why I think it's fun to like go to the dark places. Cause that's, that's play time where you don't, you don't get to do that in real life. You can get to slap people like that in real life. You, know? <laughs> you don't get to like have this fantasy of like Lucille, which we learn later is connected to his wife and it's his wife's name, but we didn't know that back then, you know? So, um, yeah. So I think that's why we like all of it, but yeah, it's it, like every episode of Walking Dead, there's too much to shoot and there's not enough time. And then the elements are working quite against you most of the time. Uh, uh, that relates to um, my question. Um, most episodic TV has an A, B, C uh, plot line in each episode. This has so many different yes. plots going on. How did you approach that, especially coming in as your first time? You know, dividing your time, did you have to delegate a lot more? How did you cope with that? I think um, that's a good question. You know, sometimes it's just... Um, on other shows, sometimes you cross board episodes. You don't do that on The Walking Dead. But what that means is that you have two episodes that you shoot at the same time. Mm -hmm. So in any given day, you could be shooting a scene from episode one and then episode two and you're bouncing all over the place. So I think as directors, we get used to bouncing all over from one thing to the next. So one of our jobs is, and a key part of the job is to sort of keep track of the story with everyone. So every scene I'm going back looking, okay, when was the last time we saw Negan? When is the last time we saw Michonne? What, and what is coming forward? And to remind myself and to remind them of where we're all at in the story. So we can come into the scene, like knowing where we just came from, where did we leave off? And then emotionally that we're in the right place and that we're setting up where we're going next. So that's a big part of the job. And sometimes I'll go to the script supervisor for help if I can't find it quick enough or something. But um, 
Yeah, we always keep track like that. I don't mind. I, as long as it's dramatic and there's conflict and there's light and dark and extremes, I love extremes. So as long as I get to go there, I'm very happy. I get energy from that. When things just sort of go like this, that's when I'm concerned. So I thrive on that adrenaline of like being like all over the place. That's fun. You know, that's really fun. Yeah. I'm trying to remember everything that happened in the episode. I'll <laughs> pull this up right now and watch it again. I just looked at it a couple of days ago. I just watched it again before this. And I'm like, but then I was watching other episodes too, unfortunately. I, I tried to write down how many different you know, story threads there were but I, was like, I, I think there's about eight wow. it? because you've got Michonne you've got Rick and Rick on you know with the water you've got uh, Spencer and Gabriel and obviously Carl and Negan. there was so oh much yeah and the fat walker in the tree right yeah, yeah exactly yeah. <laughs> I know that was, course, that was a challenge right there I know it's true <laughs> but you know what's great about all these actors is they're all so good they're really, really good. So like you wanna you wanna push them to like and also especially a show like this, it's like, you know, I'm a fan and so I wanna try to find something every time, some little moment that the actor hasn't necessarily done before. And it could be some small little thing, but it's helpful to like find that or you know, like for Carl before he had to take that off and, oh, and then sing before he had to sing like that little bit um like i brought him in the next room and i showed him the part like when his when his mom you know when his mom died the baby like he had to get oh, that was just like like you would never believe that that would happen in real life except it's so emotional that you buy into it and you're heartbroken you're like oh my god carl so i i got a clip of that on my phone and i played it for him right before we went in there so it's like oh let's connect that emotion of your mom let's remember your mom and how you felt in that moment and let's have that come to play here and so I think that helped him. I don't know if it did, but I thought it was the right thing to do. You know, I don't think it hurt him in any case, but finding those things for every character is really, really fun. And when, you know, Michonne and Rick are separated and then, you know, the walkie comes and like how much time and getting, you know, Rick just hearing her voice or trying to like connect with her, you know, that was a really good moment that for me, like fast forward to like, you know, this season when like, you know, the walkie and she's there and it's like, oh my God, that walkie can like, trying to connect those dots is like so, I think important in the show, but the, they're the emotions of the show too. You know, they're so key. So yeah, anyway, it's good, good stuff. <laughs> my turn now? Yeah, it's your turn. Okay, I, I lost track, sorry. <laughs> so I read in an interview that Jeffrey D. Morgan was super excited to have you direct this episode. Aww. So then I wondered, you know, how, how different it was to direct him as Megan, but as opposed to Jason on The Good Wife, you know, the difference there. Um, that's a good question. Um, on The Good Wife, he was not as prominent a character. <laughs> And he was more in support of um, Juliana Margley's character. So um, I think that was a little harder um, just because his character was less defined. He had less, you know, sometimes when things are written to support a, a, something that someone's doing, it's not as like they're driving the scenes. So this was a lot more fun because he's driving those scenes. <laughs> yeah. Um, but he's a great, he's a great human being. He's a great person. He's fun to be around. He's down to earth. He's just a loyal, wonderful person. So doing anything with him is okay. And he's also the kind of actor that wants direction and he wants to talk about things. So, you know, in between takes, he's like very approachable to like, Hey, how about this? What are, and, and, you know, not that I need to do that all the time, but sometimes he'll bring something and it'll spark an idea. And he's always open to that. So he's super collaborative, which is another reason I think we get along so well. 
And I think he's the kind of actor that wants that feedback and excitement. I think, you know, actors do things and they want a reaction and they want to know. And I naturally get really excited when they do stuff. I'm like, oh my God, that was amazing. And I think that just makes everyone relax and happy. Makes me happy, so. It's awesome. Um, I think I speak for everyone when we say we adore Kaylee as Judith, but oh we miss the twins so much. What was it like directing with them? Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I was just watching that last, uh, I was just watching the end of the episode and that last shot, which was really challenging because of the, the construction of the porch and that pole. And I really, really, really wanted it to be really wide and then come in and go, just in a one -er and really have it work where it just goes into Megan, he kisses her. And then, you know, it's just like, just so you feel really scared and stuff and like, oh my God, what is he gonna do next? And so that shot was, was just the most painful shot because it's so difficult. The little girls were so adorable but so not actors and not focused. <laughs> and really, he didn't really take to him. I don't know if he said that in interviews or not, but like they would cry a lot. Like they did not want, oh, it was just so hard. Even the take that's in there, you'll notice, he probably did. Like that was the best take, but she still looked like at the camera at this point. Yeah. <laughs> no, and it's like, oh, you don't get the camera. But like I was under time pressure. You know, you have twins so that you can, you know, like interchange them. So when one is is a little cranky and don't want to do it or hungry, then you have the other one. But sometimes they're both cranky and don't want to do it. So <laughs> that, they're really challenging. Yeah, they're really, really challenging. That was hard. Honestly, it's super hard. Yeah, I think that's the watching, oh, watching today was the first time I noticed that when she was just kind of sitting like in his arms that she turned around and looked right at the camera exactly i didn't notice that before <laughs> oh good i'm glad you didn't because it killed us but like i had to do it yeah <laughs> i mean i had to move on i couldn't do it again god knows we did like a bunch of those takes because she wouldn't sit still and she was all over and so it was like no it doesn't work unless she's kind of connected with him mm -hmm. otherwise there's no threat <laughs> you know what i mean you want to feel like she potentially could like hey this is like you know uncle negan so was not it was just not an easy day that day that that scene was not easy it's painful let's move on <laughs> <laughs> um john do you want to ask your next question yeah sure um a lot of the episode uh has a focus on um, power dynamics was that something you wanted to play about with in your short choices and um how you approach each scene yeah, I mean, I think it definitely it's it's about it, it's definitely about power. I mean, Negan's about power, right? But it's also about justice, and it's like, and much of the show is about what's right and what's wrong and what's just and how far do you go. I mean, we know all the themes of the show, right? So, it's like, how far is anybody gonna go? You know, like, is Michonne gonna kill this woman, this savior? Is she gonna blow her head off? Like, you know, at that point, it's like. You know, they still were not cold-blooded killers at that point, exactly. Like, they were, they'd already crossed the line, but, like, how do you use that power once you have it in the face of bigger power? And I think that um, Carl's, Carl's courage and his bravery, I think, were, um, you know, him becoming a man, like, really being a man and stepping up and being bold. And so one of the things, too, that was another challenge for me was, um, you know, when he's, when he comes out from the back of the truck and he's got the gun and the idea of, like, that they don't have guns, that they don't just blow him away. Like, I have to make this believable. Like, we know there's a comic, but now it's real life. And it's like, are all the saviors there with no guns? And like, how does Negan really get revealed there? How is it believable? What is Daryl doing? Like all of that really, you know, I, I, I struggle with trying to be organic and why they wouldn't have guns and just shoot him. So that was, you know, I just sort of had to work a lot with the writers on that and then realized that it really was gonna be 
you're going to take the ride with Carl no matter what happens in that scene. You're going to be focused on him. And that for me, it was like, all right, you know, Chandler, like you're going to be the most badass, bravest that we have ever seen you. Like you are going to come out of there with your deep voice and you're going to be like, yo, like, da 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 da. <laughs> like, you know, and that was sort of the moment that I focused on, not what everybody else was doing. Cause that was like kind of messing with my head a little bit. You know what I mean? Like, why don't they just take them down? Like, <laughs> but I, but every time I went there, I was like in trouble, you know, storytelling wise. So I was like, all right, let's just focus on giving Chandler again, giving Chandler something, a moment that he hasn't quite had before. Mm -hmm. And then pushing that, you know, that fight as much as he could. And then having that emotion come out and then being like standing up to Negan as Negan sitting there and being, I will like, you know, and giving it to him again, you know, was really, um, yeah, it was really important all those moments with him. So yeah, it's all about power. I was trying to have Carl, you know, find power within himself that he never really knew was there before that episode. Definitely. Renee? And I think the same okay. also with um, Rosita. I think Rosita too. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, I think she had a really great moment with Eugene. And that was a little difficult also, that moment. Um, because I, I wanted her to be emotional in that moment. Like I wanted some of her stuff that was repressed to come out, but also have her be strong at the same time. So we worked hard on that moment. That was not easy. And again, it was so damn hot in there. It was just <laughs> unbelievable. Um, you know, and everyone, sometimes everyone has opinions, you know, and outside of actors. And sometimes that can create a difficulty as well, just for me, you know what I mean? So, you know, it's navigating a lot, but I was really proud of her and really happy for that moment with Eugene. I think that went really well also. Well, then with the, the tree, the, it was a tree stand rock walker, right? Like yeah. I will not be saying all that about being so hot. And I'm really curious as to how, you know, filming that went. <laughs> oh my God, that poor guy. <laughs> because he was a fat walker and then it was also it wasn't enough that he's up there in the tree he's got the you know the weapon that he, that he you know he wants to get to but then it's like he's also overweight so he's like fat which there's a little skinny guy in there right like he's like a little guy so he's loaded up with like stuff to make him like hot i'm worried he's gonna pass out it's so hot oh god and then on top of it it's like not enough that precarious situation but then his arms are supposed to rip off and I don't feel like honestly that I did that justice I, I feel like I fell short of trying to get the right coverage get you know shoot up high enough and get tight enough on the arms ripping off they just kind of come off and fall but again, I want it to be very graphic and like, oh my God, and just have it like rip <laughs> off. But it just wasn't, it wasn't possible. It wasn't, it wasn't possible to get close enough. It wasn't possible to get that footage. It just, I had to move on. And I was really quite bummed about that, actually. When I watch it, I, I guess it doesn't matter so much, but it's a little bit missed uh, for me, just the graphic nature yeah. is a little missed because every walker, again, Greg Nicotero and K and B, you know, uh, they're all like Karen and I mean, they're all like amazing people and Jake and Kevin, like they're all like busting their ass to make it great and to make every single walker kill be unique. You can imagine over all these years, like how much work just to come up with a different scenario. And so I never want to sell that short. I want to honor that. And I feel that particular walker, I feel like I sold it a little short, not to take the whole blame. I mean, the schedule was too big and I, I didn't have time or the right um, ladder to get up there tight enough to get what I want or the right lens. So it was a little messed up, but anyway, we'll move on from that too. Cause now I'll get sad. <laughs> <laughs> well, I thought it looked impressive, so, you know. Oh, I'm so glad. Yeah, 
<laughs> oh, yeah, I was really worried about him, like, you know, passing sure. out in that, suit, in that suit. Trust me. Oh, I didn't think about that, being covered in all of that and the heat. Well, that oh, actually goodness. helps. That, like, you know, all the walkers that are laying there on the street to, like, the speed bump walkers? Like, I mean, that day also, it's brutally hot. I have like a cool photo of like everyone like hold like you know people are holding like umbrellas over them just to try to get a little shade on them because oh, yeah. they're not only in these things but they're piled up on top of each other mm -hmm. and so what really helps me and I'm sure the other actors is you look at these background people and some of them have been there from the first episode I mean they they are hardcore like we're fans they're fans that show up and do the dirty work for us. <laughs> and looking at them and, and understanding what they're going through, really, how can I complain about being hot when I see what they're doing? Do you know what I mean? So it's sort of, yeah. again, you can't complain about it. <laughs> We're all hot and miserable, but nobody says that. We're not like, oh my God. It's just like, hey, can I get another water? That's the most you complain. <laughs> so the lake walkers really made out in that episode because they could... Yeah. The lake. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, you talk about uh, how you're like a really big fan going in. What what was it like being a fan going in, but also going in under the tone of like Negan being like oppressive to everyone? Like it's this it's this big big bad, such a big fan, but at the same time having to like buckle down and be like, this is serious. And this is what everyone is really going through right now. Well, I think that happens naturally. Like I'm the same as you, like I'm just connected to the characters. So you just can't really separate that. You know, I think that, um, you know, it loses a little bit of, <clears throat> of I mean, it, it grows in a way as a director, just because I know um, them personally some of, you know, and some of the actors more than others, but so it just deepens, like it gives it a more three-dimensional thing. But as far as the show go, the characters, I mean, they're kind of like become like probably for you guys, like the same in a way. So I don't know. I, I think that, I think that what, the only thing that changes is when I know what's gonna happen. Like when I knew what Negan, uh, was gonna do like you know six months earlier and you know I couldn't I couldn't like I didn't tell my husband like I didn't tell anybody um I couldn't I didn't want to tell anybody because anyone that's a fan you're gonna ruin it like why would you want to yeah. ruin that moment I know what but, that's like <laughs> yeah but then when I watched it all cut it was still devastating but I had to go through like reading it first and being sad on my own, like without really sharing that with anyone. Cause I think I was here in LA when I read it even, it wasn't like I was around everybody. So, you know, but then when it aired, I was like so upset. And then my husband watched it the first time and he was like, I mean, for two days, like, you know, like two days was like really depressed. It's like, it was hard to take. It was like, wow. So, yeah, maybe I, there's a little edge of that taken off, but I experienced the same thing. And I think that's, that's why I want more of it. That's why you want more of it. That's why, you know, directing, it's like you want to get in there more. So I think it just helps to really love the people and the characters and the story. So yeah, it's all like, it's a gift. And I, you know, I can't help but think of, you know, like being able to direct a show like, at some point in my career, I was like, I just needed the paycheck and nobody was talking about female directors. So the window was literally closed, it, like this much of a crack. And it was sort of like the generation before me that got hired and then I did. And it really took me a long time to get going. And, and you know, showing up for jobs for a paycheck as a director is really, it's just, it's not why I do it. So it's hard. It's like, and then at some point, like busting my ass enough to get to the point where I just get to direct what I want to watch is like, oh, it's such a gift. It's like, oh my God, I'm finally here. And then realizing 
only recently through this, again, through this time alone and being a little more introspective, um, how much I'm drawn to certain shows and why, and partly it is because like The Walking Dead, because it is diverse, because it represents the whole world, because it's people talking about love and life and killing and justice and how far are you gonna go and what is a family and what does it mean? And, and it's inclusive and it's just like, we take that for granted and in a way, I think there's no, it's more important than ever to have shows like that. And anyone doesn't, that doesn't know that about the show and thinks it's about walkers or zombies, they're missing out on like what a gift this show is for actors too. I mean, anyway, so I've been just having like a deeper relationship, I think with the <laughs> show recently where I'm like so grateful to at least have a, have a place where I know we've all been treated well. Crazy. One on that note, as a, uh, as a fan, um, you know, so obviously Angela King and Corey Reed wrote this episode. Yeah. And I it's love really, them all. Oh, it's, it's beautiful. It's such a, it's such a beautiful episode, but it was kind of interesting to think that there's that moment when Spencer is, is in the car and he's like, you know, Hey, we, we just killed all those people. Like, you know, and, and there were these little kind of tidbits, you know, like we know what happens with that bullet and what that, what, what that leads to. And, you know, there's all these, these kind of foreshadowing moments. But jumping forward as a fan watching season 10 and watching Michonne's ex exit from the show, mm -hmm. did you look back and think, wow, like we kind of talked like, because they don't really address, Glenn got into the, the morals of what they did at that outpost. Mm -hmm. Spencer's the only one who really kind of says like, hey, like maybe, maybe we shouldn't have done it. Like he has this really interesting look at it. Right. Did you, did you draw any parallels between how, you know, that, that flashback moment or that not flashback, but the um, alternate reality, that, that drug induced haze dream that Michonne had um, and think like, wow, wow there, there is some parallels to, to this episode that, that Angela did, you know, back in season seven. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think, you know, one of the things that probably, probably the only thing that bugged me moving on from, from, you know, when they kind of go in the middle of the night and kill the saviors that are sleeping and in cold blood and like cross that line is that it really never got talked about enough and that nobody really took responsibility. And I was always like, when is somebody gonna say it's their fault? Like they set the ball rolling. Like they don't really, they kind of skirt it all the time. But um, I think that, um, oh, I just lost my train of thought. That moment, with Father Gabriel, he's a fascinating character also because he's like, he wants to think about things, but then he doesn't because if he does, then he's got to confront his own cowardice and his own fear. And so he pushes it away for so long. And then, you know, the arc of these characters is like so fascinating. And Michonne is interesting. Most, her and Carol are so fascinating to me because they are you know, like warriors in this. And they've always been warriors. Like Michonne was always like ready to do what she needed to do. And the fact that she kind of goes off um, at the end, I feel like it, it sort of represented that like, because once you've killed like that, and once you've done something morally, and you could say wrong, I could say ambiguous, but like, you know, you've crossed the line and that you can't go back, then I think that there has to be some salvation for that. And I don't know what's coming, but I feel like there has to be forgiveness. There has to be some, like, I'm kind of a sucker for like, you know, happy endings too. So I'm like, in my mind, I'm like, okay, she'll find, I don't have a clue what's going to happen, mind you, but I'm like, <laughs> she's going to find happiness for all of the strength and the protection that she's given people. And she's going to get to relax a little bit. You know what I mean? And clearly her going off with a herd and like, oh, it doesn't look like relaxation, but like <laughs> in my mind, I'm like, you know, there's bigger pictures. There's, um, there was an episode that Greg did and it involved them, it, the, the shot got cut down 
Um, but it was when they were at night and they were trying to, in Alexandria, remember they ended up burning stuff and they were just like one-on-one -on -one trying to get with the walkers. It was all these single shots of like, boom, boom, and slow-mo. And it was just, it was just brutal. It was just a brutal war in that moment. And then there was a flashback, like it wasn't a flashback, like a fantasy sequence. Do you remember where they were all sitting at the table? Mm -hmm. You probably remember that episode better than I do, like what number it was and stuff like that. But you know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah. Yep. So there's this beautiful wonder of like going down the street and there's a little toy and there's like little kids. And it was basically like, look at what if none of this happened these people would be a family and we'd be together. And this is what a day would look like for them. And I remember feeling that like the poetry of the shot that he did, and again, it got edited down um, for the episode. It went on much longer and it was very poetic. But I remember that little glimpse of like what life can be for them and how these people get to um, just love, like live in love only was like so profound for me that I still want to get there. Like I want them all to get there. And so I've always held on to that particular moment to balance out whatever they need to do. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Okay, that's cool. Cause I'm, I don't know if it makes sense. It seems very poetic to me, but, <laughs> but that to me, it would be the justice of everything is that, you know, love sort of wins and they get to be in that place. And, you know, we've all done fucked up things. So you have to find forgiveness in there. Right. So that is, that is something they've given each other sometimes or like Rick forgave, forgave Carol. Not that he really had to, but like he went there, you know, I did a, another episode where Rick and Daryl were in the hole and sort of, and that, that also came up a little bit, like what Maggie's, because it's really Maggie's decision, not really Rick's decision to me, in my recollection. Like she's the one that sent them out there. Like she, you know, but again, it's like it, it peaked in that, that conversation too a little bit. But anyway, I feel like I went off on a tangent. <laughs> Care. We're like enthralled. <laughs> oh good, I'm so glad because I'm like, you know, it is all connected and you do want to honor that. And I also just need to say that I think that, you know, Angela Kang, I just think she has kicked fucking ass, man. She has taken yeah. over and woof, like just really incredible work. I mean, really amazing. I, th I think it's amazing in season 10 that, um, any complaint that any fan has had in the past, Angela has addressed it this season. Yeah. It's like she's saying, yeah. I'm going to make sure there is nothing <laughs> to get through this. You know, it's exactly yeah. what it should be, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And after 10 seasons, that's quite amazing, quite a feat. Well, I think, I think it was very risky and very ballsy of like Scott Gimple to sort of, you know, have, um, again, I'm like, what's the um, season six I get no after they all separated which was I don't know what season seven seven right yeah, yeah. well yeah. okay I'm gonna say eight but it's seven season seven where they all like you went so long without seeing people yeah. and which is another reason why I like this episode that there's a lot of people in it mm -hmm. thank god because you know I'm watching the season and I'm like oh, where, you know, where's Carol? Where's Daryl? Like, then they're all separate. And it was, it kind of took that, that evening with Negan and the depression of that and the devastation. And then you just lived in the depression for like the whole season. And I thought that was, I know a lot of people didn't like that and maybe people stopped watching. For me, I thought that creatively, that was ballsy. And I thought, we're just going to stay sad and we're going to miss these characters a lot. And then of course they come back with like a fierceness that's like, yes. And then you're rooting for them again to be together and to fight. And to, but I thought that was kind of ballsy myself. I liked it. Definitely. I mean, I actually never really considered it that way. Like the, there was that overarching kind of depression. Yeah. That, you know, there was a depression of what was happening, but that it was potentially, you know, intentional to, to create that. That puts, a, that puts a really interesting spin on it. Well, that's how I saw it. It's not like I had that conversation with Scott Gimble, but that's right. how I saw it. And I think that's what it was because you really, and, and the to see Daryl tortured, to see people you love, like have to be in yeah. this 
for months at a time. It's like, oh my God, it was so much to bear. Mm-hmm. Right. So the audience is really feeling the same as the characters. So I think so. Everybody's split up and they're all missing each other. Just yeah. we're missing them. Yeah. That's why I think creatively it was so ballsy. And I'm like, what kind of fan is going to drop off right now? <laughs> People who don't want to feel bad feelings. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But you know what? That's part of life. And that's, again, the gift of the show. We have to. Right now, is especially, we have to feel what we feel. The anger, the, the depression. The confusion you got to feel those things and I think I think that season sort of really forced us to and I thought that was beautiful myself that was great and I was ready for it to end too <laughs> <laughs> well awesome well Rosemary I know I promised you it would be about an hour does anybody have any final questions or thoughts or anything that you'd like to share Rosemary before we call it a day um, I guess I'm just really um sort of uh grateful that there's a lot of people. I feel like, um, you know, one of the things that people don't necessarily know is um, how much the enthusiasm for, you know, I'm just a director, right? So I'm behind the scenes. I'm not, I'm not, you know, Norman out in the world protesting, or I'm not, you know, I'm not like sort of out in the face of anything. Um, but, and it can be really hard, quite honestly, to be. I'm just going to say it, a female director can be really challenging. Um, And it can be hard just being a a director in general. It's just a challenging job. So I think just to say thank you for watching, for supporting, like in, like in a real way, it really means a lot. Like, you know, I know like when Sunday comes and I'm like, oh, wish I was watching The Walking Dead. I know there's like thousands of people that are having that same feeling. So I'm like, oh, let me just dig in and like see if I can find something. And it makes me happy when I look at the photo because God knows there's a million things going on in our lives at any given time, right? Like literally my sister just passed away three weeks ago. So I'm like, it's been very hard time in the world for me personally, but to know that there's like something that I do that matters in the world, like you guys matter that we get to have a reprieve because this is our passion. You know, other people have passion for, you know, cooking pizza or whatever, like this is my passion and to be able to share it and have people appreciate it and pick up on the little nuances that I work so hard for. Um, And to have people pick up on that is really special. And so I just wanna say thank you for that. And it's always a gift to create something and have people respond. It's just, it's, it's everything. It's just everything. So I really appreciate it a lot. I just want to say it's awesome that we're all women. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm talking to a female director about a female run show, which is in the horror genre, which is male it's amazing. I know. I'm attached <laughs> to two movies, two um, in genre movies that I'm hoping once this come, once we come out of this, that you know one of them will go into production at least so we'll see what happens but um yeah we'll see (laughs) supposed to do a creep show supposed to do another walking dead who knows we don't know what's going to happen which makes this all all the more special so if you ever want to talk about another episode (laughs) i'm down i was i was just gonna (laughs) say we we definitely this is this has been kind of an experiment we we talked to mikey last week and we were kind of working out the kinks and 